Welcome everybody, my name is Mina Jane and I am the director of the Ashland Public Library and I'm really thrilled to be here with Nia Keith, who will be um, talking about climate change and the disproportionate effect or impact on um, uh, populations of color. But before we get to Nia, I just wanted to say a few things. One is that I would like to thank the friends of the Ashland Library for supporting all of our programming. We couldn't do it without them. And also this particular program is um, in collaboration with several libraries, the um, Brookline Library, Dedham Library, and the Cary Library in Lexington. And I always feel like, you know, when libraries get together, we can, you know, create some magic. So I'm really pleased to, uh, to be partnering with them. And um, so now, Nia, awesome, <laughs> exciting, um, is, works for Mass Audubon, She's a social justice educator and a consultant with more than 15 years of experience working in nonprofits, schools, and cultural institutions. Like I said, she currently works at Mass Audubon, and she's the first vice president for diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice at that organization. And I have to say that that is so exciting to hear um, that Mass Audubon is going in that direction and has hired somebody who I think just sounds amazing. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Nia. Uh, oh, wait, I do have a little ado. <laughs> um, I would ask that you all stay muted during the conversation. And then please put any chatter or comments in the chat. I will be hand, um, moderating those with Nia. But she's going to have a couple of stopping points in her talk where she's going to ask for your, uh, your comments. And I will ask you to unmute at that time. And I will call on you to, um, to speak and to tell um, Nia your story or ask your question or to have your voice in this meeting. So now, without further ado, I hand it over to Nia. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me and thank you to all the partner libraries who are putting on this presentation tonight. Um, obviously, I'm super excited because climate justice is a huge piece of my own personal work. Um, when I got hired at Mass Audubon, um, March 2nd of 2020, literally one week before the pandemic shut everything down. Um, my original role at that point with the organization was as statewide climate change education manager. So I came in there um, to really help Mass Audubon develop its voice around climate um, and climate work and how that is part of everything that we do. Um, and what made my spin on it different, I think, than a lot of people was that a lot of people talk about climate um, from the standpoint of ecological impacts and um, science and technology for solutions. And I see things very differently. Um, I center people in the conversation and I center equity and justice. And because of my focus on really pushing equity and justice as a lens for all of our work, um, I was able to help to craft the um, action agenda that Mass Audubon currently has adopted, which is our five-year strategic plan, and was part of the um, underwriting of the um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice aspects of that. Um, and part of adopting that action agenda was really centering the fact that we needed to elevate the work in our organization to an executive level and the position of vice president for DEIJ was created. Um, and I feel very fortunate that when I applied for the position, they, they felt that I was the right person to fill that role. So I have been in my role as VP for DEIJ for just over a year now. And even though my role has shifted to a much larger overall um, role of looking at all aspects of equity, inclusion and accessibility in the organization, working towards climate justice is, is still at the heart of what I do um, personally as an advocate in this world. So having said all that, I am now going to share my screen and jump into this presentation for tonight because I cannot wait to engage all of y'all in a conversation about this super critical topic. Okay. And can I get a head nod if people can see the screen? It looks good. Thank you so much, Jean. I see the head nod and the thumbs up. <laughs> Appreciate that. All righty, so here we go. 
Before we get started with tonight's um, full topic, I want to start with an acknowledgement of land and history. Um, and because I find this to be so critical and the wording um, so important, language matters, I'm going to read this directly from my screen. The environmental problems we are facing today are rooted in a history of exploitation, land theft, and genocide. The history has power if we are willing to see the truth of it and learn and learn from the, from the past. To that end, I'd like to begin this presentation by acknowledging that we are occupying the traditional, contemporary, and unceded territory of indigenous peoples. The land and sea has long been rich with wildlife, plants, minerals, and trees, and indigenous peoples have lived as part of the land and co-created abundant ecosystems long before European and colonizers arrived. The land was taken from its original stewards, causing harm that continues to this day. And today, indigenous communities across the globe are at the front line of climate change activism, land stewardship efforts, and conservation. It's important that their voices and work be centered in the environmental movement. So I ask everyone to take some time to discover and elevate their work. Learn and speak the names of the people on the front lines of this movement. Lastly, make sure to find out how you can help. Thank you. So, climate justice. The first thing I would like to do, oh, this is the first interactive piece of our program, by the way. So the first thing that I would like you all to do is consider this um, climate change definition. This is a definition that I developed as statewide climate change um, education manager. And what I'd like you all to do is to think about what is different in this definition than in other definitions of climate change you may have encountered. And I will read it out loud for those who are auditory learners. Climate change is a rapid change in global climate patterns, which is threatening the sustainability of human and natural systems caused by human activities that release greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. The effects of climate change can be mitigated through large scale actions and policies that support natural or sorry, nature based climate solutions, reduce or eliminate greenhouse gases and address social and economic disparities. So besides the length of the definition, <laughs> um, what do y'all notice that is different about this one than other definitions you may have seen from say NOAA or um, NASA or even like school definitions? And feel free to unmute and share or use the chat function. Is it, I'll, I'm, I'll wait for anybody else because I do have some, <laughs> some thoughts on why it's different. Anybody want to speak up or say something in the chat about why this is different? Can I take a guess, Nia? Please. Oh, Terry says social and economic disparities is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll notice that I include social and economic disparities um, and also you'll notice that I don't include it as the part of the impacts. I actually include it as one of the solutions is dealing with those things. So that's a good one. What else is different about this one? Either chat or unmute or Nina, if you have, you have thoughts, you can share. <laughs> <laughs> I always have thoughts. <laughs> People okay. who know me know that. Um, yeah. I think that this really, you know, um, says very clearly that it is because of human behavior, which I think a lot of places try to avoid. Yes, thank you for pointing that out, because actually that is something, when I do this presentation, people rarely point that out as one of the differences, but it is an important thing in here is that I want it, it to be front and center, that there is no question that this is human cause. <laughs> this is, there's no debate. This is definitely a human issue. Um, so thank you. Any other thoughts around what is different about this definition? If not, I'll flip to the next slide where I will break it down. <laughs> Let's look at the next slide. I'm not seeing any, any comments or anything. All right. Well, some of the things that I highlighted when I wrote this definition is making sure to point out that um, rapid was really important for me to put in there because there are people who are still um, deniers of climate change or 
maybe just not wanting to deal with it, that kind of acting as if, even if it's real, we have some time, we don't have time. Things are moving faster than the environment can handle. And if the environment can't handle it, we have nothing left to stand on. So talking about how quickly this is changing is super important. We are moving beyond the scale of ecological time. Um, I also think that it's really important, as Mina pointed out, to, that this is, this is something that is threatening the sustainability of human systems, but next bullet also caused by human systems, <laughs> right? So we caused it and we're feeling the impacts of it. Probably the most important piece of this definition though that is different than others is that I wanted to emphasize solutions. Oftentimes when people talk about climate change, it is in these doom and gloom scenarios where we go on and on about the impacts and I'm gonna do that in like two minutes. So bear with me. <laughs> but people rarely get to the point where we talk about how do we do something about it? And I think that it is not, I just think research has shown that if we want people to act on climate change, people have to have some ideas about what they can do. So although we are going to talk tonight about impacts and some of them are extremely dire, we are gonna spend the other half of the time talking about solutions and what we can do as individuals and most importantly, as a collective. And then yes, as um, someone has stated in the chat, the other really critical piece about this definition is the focus on addressing social and economic disparities. And that is at the heart of the presentation that I'm going to give tonight. So although the impacts of climate change are being felt everywhere, not everyone experiences these impacts proportionately. Some communities are impacted more than others. And the sad truth is that the communities that have historically been the most oppressed and marginalized are also the same communities that often are experiencing the first and the worst effects of environmental harm and degradation, including climate change impacts. And this didn't happen by accident. This oppression has been achieved systematically and intentionally through laws, policies, and social norms. The system of oppression was designed and it relies upon a capitalist economy that is built upon, built by and depends upon extraction and exploitation of natural resources and people. And I think it's so important to look at that extraction and exploitation of natural resources and people. If not that, like, to my opinion, when you think about slavery in America, that is the definition of it. You stole and extracted people from one area to force their labor, labor to extract natural resources from another area. This is at the heart of our economy. And our economy is designed in such a way that it can only keep going if it grows. If you ever listen to NPR or other news sources and they are talking about the economy, the question is always, well, how do we grow the economy? The economy is shrinking, it can't shrink. Stop and think for a minute. Is there a single thing in the natural world that was designed to grow indefinitely without ever having a period of downtime, death, or renewal? No. And so we've created a system that is supposed to extract endlessly and continue to get bigger while it does it. It's not possible. And so what's happening is that we are having a breakdown of the system, not just the environmental system, but a breakdown of the social system that keeps those oppressions going. And in some parts of our world, the breakdown of the environmental system and the social systems collide very distinctly. There are places that have been purposely designated as sacrifice zones. These are areas um, where the waste and pollution of the extractive economy are allowed to be concentrated. And this land is considered a worthy sacrifice in the exchange for progress and the growth of the economy. But it's not just these plots of land that are considered like expendable. The people who live on and around these lands are also considered to a greater or lesser extent expendable. 
And I want to get down into some definitions here about what some of these sacrifice zones can look like. Specifically, I want to talk about frontline and fence line communities, which are terms you may have heard if you have been following some um, environmental justice and climate justice conversations. But if not, let's take a look at them together. So a frontline community is a community that experiences the first and the worst consequences of climate change. These neighborhoods often lack basic infrastructure or up-to-date infrastructure to support them, and they will become increasingly vulnerable as our climate deteriorates because they don't even have the infrastructure to deal with the changing um, precipitation, the heat, the stress that that puts on the human systems. A fence line community is a neighborhood that is immediately adjacent to a polluting company and is directly affected by the noise, odors, um, chemical emissions, traffic, parking, and just the daily operations. So when you think about a fence line community, we are literally talking about like, here is the company and all right on the other side of the fence is people who live there. Oftentimes the people who work at said company, but even though they are working there for their you know, monetary survival, they are getting the impacts of the environmental degradation which we'll talk about more later, um, but that impacts health, um, abilities to maintain wealth, and a number of other resiliency factors. The effects of being exposed to such pollutants are exacerbated by climate change, impacting the health and the economy of the residents. And because race and racism have been used as the predominant tool in our country to divide and undermine people, the climate vulnerable communities are often composed of people of color. So there is more than race at play here. Although we are gonna talk a lot about race and ethnicity, but there is more than race at play. You know, our identities are multifaceted um, and they incorporate everything from our age and our education to our gender expression, even whether or not we're parents. Um, these are all aspects of our identities, and the unique combination of all of these facets influence every part of our lives, from where we are likely to live to how likely we are to have access to clean water and health care. The term intersectionality was coined by lawyer and civil rights advocate um, Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 to describe the overlapping identities, um, how overlapping identities create particular experiences of oppression. And again, another term people may have heard, but I want to make sure we are all on the same page with the definition. According to the Merriam-Webster Merriam Dictionary, intersectionality is the complex cumulative way in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination, such as racism, sexism, and classism, combine, overlap, or intersect, especially in the experiences of marginalized individuals or groups. So it's not as cut and dry as saying, oh, because I'm a black person, I'm automatically gonna live in a neighborhood that is environmentally degraded. But what it does mean is that because of the intersectional oppressions of racism, sexism, and in my case, um, discrimination against people in the LGBTQIA 2S plus community, um, I have a lot more barriers to overcome, not to wind up being undermined and being in a position where I'm living in a community that is more vulnerable. And so that means that with every layer of overcoming, it's more likely a person is gonna find themselves in a situation where they are more highly impacted. So because of intersectional oppression, there are several populations that find themselves at higher risk of climate vulnerability. And so of course, as I had said before, people of color do rank at the top of that list. But also you have women and gender non-conforming people, people with disabilities, very young people um, and youth, the elderly, and then people who are living in disinvested communities. And we'll talk more about the disinvested community thing, but you'll notice that I didn't say poor communities, I didn't say like economically disadvantaged because I wanna name what actually is at play here, the system at play. 
And the truth of the matter is the communities that are the most vulnerable were purposefully disinvested. Money was decided to be removed from those communities, leaving them historically in a place where they are more, more vulnerable. And it's important when we do this kind of equity work that we really name the systems. So in the next few slides, I'm actually gonna go through these different populations and speak um, a little bit about some of the different ways that these populations are more impacted because of intersectional oppression. And it's a lot of information. It's gonna be like drinking through a fire hose, but I feel confident that we as a group can get through it. <laughs> so here we go. Okay, race. So many of you have probably heard of practices like redlining, which redlining was a practice that happened um, in the last century where the government actually was giving, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The government was giving uh, guidelines to banks, lenders, um, people who were developing um, real estate around how to determine whether or not an area was a good risk for investment. And part of that process was that people literally took maps of different cities, towns, this happened all over the country, and they graded them. Um, and areas that were considered good investments got um, circled in blue and green. Those areas were considered places that you could get a loan and banks happily gave loans to developers to be able to build subdivisions, parks, you name it. They were invested in. But other communities were circled with yellow lines or red lines. And a red line community was considered a poor investment. And banks would not give money to red line communities, um, to companies who wanted in, to invest in building homes and things in those communities. Where the systemic oppression comes in is that the very presence of Black people living in a community as little as 2% of the community could be enough for that community to be termed a redlined community. Developing communities where Black people lived was considered a bad investment. And so because of that, you can now look at maps decades later and see the places that have greenery, green spaces, the places that have better air quality, the places that have larger homes and larger plots of land and public spaces are the ones that were designated green and blue. The ones that were designated as red are the ones where industry was encouraged to come in, where it became a sacrifice zone. And unfortunately, money was not invested into these communities. And so through practices such as redlining and other forms of the systemic oppression, people of color often find themselves living in communities that bear the brunt of environmental harm. This comes in many forms, you know, from being parts of fence line communities where they have um, power plants and waste processors right there in their community to the act of stripping urban centers from tree canopies and green space. Um, and without those natural um, resources, it the, the cannot bear um, the blunt of the impacts of warming the warming planner, planet. And the intersectionality of race means that people of color are also less likely to have access to health care if they do become sick from the environmental exposures. Um, and they're more likely to have occupations that bring them into direct contact or close contact with these um, damaging conditions. And then the kind of like last blow in this whole cocktail is that people of color are often marginalized from having the same kind of political and economic power to change the system. Think about all the conversations we've had in the last decade around voter suppression. So not only are people of color historically been kind of forced into places um, that are ecologically damaged, but on top of it, their political power has been um, blunted so that they can't even be the people making the decisions about the places they live most often. All right, we're gonna shift and talk about gender. In the United States and globally, women are much more likely to be victims of poverty than men. And this means they are more likely to live in communities with fewer resources and older infrastructure. And they are less likely to have access to healthcare. 
All of this means that in the event of a climate disaster, women are more likely to die. And in fact, statistics show that women are 14 times more likely to die during a climate disaster than men. And gender can affect people's survival in other ways too. Women are more likely to experience violence during displacement or emergency situations. Also, transgendered and not gender non-conforming people are seven times more likely to experience violence at the hand of law enforcement. So not only do women and gender non-conforming people have to contend with the heightened threat of the climate disaster itself, but just having the change of the environment that comes with it means that they are at risk of violence as they are being displaced. And in the case of gender nonconforming and transgender people, the very people who should be trying to help law enforcement may actually be the perpetrators of said violence. Let's talk about ability. So ability is a large umbrella and it can encompass all manner of people's cognitive, physical and emotional um, experiences. It also can include people who have experienced trauma. All of the different kinds of disabilities can impact a person's ability to avoid, adapt and recover from climate change impacts. So just a few things to consider. A person who um, might be physically disabled, perhaps they are non-ambulatory, might find it difficult to evacuate an area or to locate a shelter that can accommodate their physical needs, leaving them vulnerable to impacts. In fact, we have seen this happen in disaster situations repeatedly, even in this country, where when the disaster comes, people who are on life-saving equipment, people who are non-ambulatory are simply just left behind. A person with cognitive disabilities may not be able to sufficiently plan for a climate emergency, or they may have difficulties responding to the, um, the, the information they're giving during the event in a timely manner, which can also reduce the chances of survival. And then lastly, a person who's experienced trauma or suffering from mental illness may not have the coping mechanisms to make, it appro make appropriate decisions in the face of crisis, or may have lasting impacts on their health after the crisis. Now we'll talk about age. So whether you are on the older end of the spectrum or the younger end of the spectrum, climate change can have bigger impacts. So children are more vulnerable to climate change and environmental pollutants in general for a number of reasons. Um, for one, they have smaller bodies, right? And their bodies have not completely formed yet which means that toxins can build up faster than them and make them ill. And exposure to, exposures to a toxic environment when they're younger may trigger lifelong health issues. Um, and things like health issues that affect the lungs are particularly important when we think about climate impacts because as the planet warms, um, asthma and other, um, are, other lung um, conditions are gonna be exacerbated and made worse. And so if somebody is impacted as a child, when they're older, they have even more to deal with. Also, like women, children are more likely to be affected by poverty, which reduces their access to healthcare, education, and other resources that may determine their proximity to environmental hazards. For older people, um, many may suffer from climate change impacts for some of the reasons listed under the um, ability page. You know, many older people might have deteriorating immune systems, which can lead to serious illness. They may lack mobility or have mental impairments, which, make it, um, which makes it difficult for them to respond in the face of a climate disaster. And additionally, you know, many elderly people suffer from social isolation um, in our society, which is something that we saw a great deal of during the height of the COVID crisis. You saw um, older people who were just unable to keep going emotionally because they were so isolated. And so in the case of a climate disaster, people who are isolated may not have the networks or support that they would otherwise need to survive the worst impacts. And the last thing that I want to talk about before we take a quick break, um, or at least a break from me talking and I get, a, get some feedback from y'all, um, is I want to talk about class. So when we talk about communities that have been disinvested, 
many of which are communities of color, as I said before, these communities are vulnerable to climate change impacts a lot. Due to generations of disinvestment, these communities are often have impaired infrastructure, which leads to increased flooding, property damage, and also displacement. Um, and oftentimes there is an insufficient amount of green space causing the heat island effect where residents can experience temperatures several degrees hotter than their suburban and rural counterparts. So with the heat island effect, it literally means that in urban spaces, it can be anywhere from three to seven degrees hotter than it is in surrounding rural or suburban spaces because of the lack of tree canopy and other green space, which helps to um, absorb and not re-radiate um, the heat of the sun. And so all of those things means that people living in disinvested communities are facing greater impacts from climate change. Um, and additionally, when we think about it, these places often are very crowded and under-resourced. They may not have um, enough civil departments or um, you know, emergency responders to deal with an evacuation in the case of a climate disaster. And so during a climate disaster, these residents may not be able to evacuate effectively and people could, could suffer or die. I also wanna share this slide when we talk about the impact to disinvested communities. Um, you know, oftentimes the people who have made these places their homes, sometimes for generations, after they have been destroyed by a climate disaster, they don't have the resources to rebuild. And oftentimes the government does not assist in rebuilding. People are simply forced to become, um, to, to leave. And so this picture here is actually a picture that was taken um, just the year before COVID struck. And this is an image from New Orleans Lower Ninth Ward, which was devastated by Hurricane Katrina. And that was over 16 years ago. It still has not recovered. They have not rebuilt it. These people have permanently lost their home. And so to summarize this part of it, I want to say that the roots of environmental exploitation are intertwined with the roots of human exploitation. I'll say that again because it's so critical. The roots of environmental exploitation are intertwined with the roots of human exploitation. And we cannot solve one without the other. And in the traditional environmental movement, um, the needs of people with marginalized identities are often sidelined and ignored. But I genuinely believe that we cannot solve climate change unless we are solving the underlying social injustice issues and the system that brought us to this point. So for that reason, I will always say there is no climate action without climate justice. And so I'm gonna pause now I'm gonna drink some water, but I also am gonna invite um, y'all to tell me and tell each other, let's have a conversation. What is bubbling up right now? Feel free to unmute and speak or use the chat feature. So while, while you all are thinking about what you wanna say or write, um, I'm gonna ask Nia about, um, you know, we have these constant uh, climate events now, and I always think, you know, when they evacuate an area over and over again of the people that stay and mm -hmm. you think, why are they staying? Well, you know, that's probably a huge part of like this conversation that they don't have resources to go to. They don't have, they can't leave their jobs, even though that, you know, so I don't know, I'm just kind of like talking, but I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, definitely there's so many of the things that I mentioned in that long list could be a factor in why people don't leave. You know, we, I think oftentimes I'll speak for myself, like as a person who has the economic advantage of owning my own vehicle, I can just jump in my car in the case of a climate emergency. Um, so for example, um, I live in the North shore of Massachusetts and back in 2018, um, the pipelines owned by Columbia Gas exploded. People may have heard about this in the news and made national news. My home was in that impact zone. We had to evacuate and leave our home. I didn't have gas, heat, <laughs> a stove mm -hmm. for three months. Um, but <laughs> yeah, and, and it was it was winter. Um, but I was able to get in my car when the police were coming down the street and blocking off everything and told us we had to go. 
I had the economic advantage to be able to grab my cat, talk to my partner, get in a car and go. I also was advantaged and privileged enough that there was within a few towns from where I live, my partner's family owned a home that was large enough to give us space to shelter for some days until they had cleared our host house and told us that at least we could go back in without fear that it would blow up. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of those things are privileges that so many people don't have. They don't have their own personal vehicle. They may not have family or friends nearby that they can go to. Their friends may not have homes large enough to shelter them in their cats, in my case. <laughs> um, you know, but these are important things. When we say, why don't they leave? The question should be, what can we do to help them? Because there's probably a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Actually, Susan writes, often people don't leave because their property has become worthless or so degraded that no one will buy it. Mm. Yep. And that's the other thing is like, what are we doing to help people get out of places that are, you know, have been destroyed or degraded by the environment? Um, you know, and the, the systemic oppression that I was talking to around um, disinvestment is a big reason as to why people's property goes down. I mean, we have a history in the United States where when neighborhoods become um, filled with people of color, especially Black people, um, other peoples move out and the value of the property of the neighborhood declines. Mm -hmm. And so then you find, I mean, like there is a history of extremely hardworking, you know, families, Black families in particular, that worked really hard to be able to buy a home in a particular neighborhood, only to find 10 years later that the value of that home is less than they paid for because now Black people live there. Mm -hmm. um, and so what does that mean when just being Black could literally decline your the wealth? Like home ownership is a cornerstone of wealth building for the American middle class. But what if that's not the case because of the color of your skin? And that is a real, a real factor in our country. Mm -hmm. Helen says, seeing the images of New Orleans is so disturbing. It's unbelievable that it's been 16 years and people are still trying to live in these damaged neighborhoods. Has there been no assistance at all? There has been assistance in some neighborhoods. In fact, I've been to New Orleans since, you know, they've rebuilt some neighborhoods and definitely there has been neighborhoods that were rebuilt, but a lot of neighborhoods were not rebuilt. They, it's, I mean, I don't want to say that they're using these terms. This is not an official term, but essentially it's kind of like when your car gets damaged and your real estate company or your um, your insurance company decides whether or not the car should be repaired or whether it's just not worth the repair. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what's happened to some of these neighborhoods, except for nobody's putting in the money to buy them a new neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Right. It is, it's heartbreaking it to is. see that. Um, I actually have a question that is, is slightly off topic, but I, I'm always concerned about things like food insecurity and of course climate change is, accelerating a lot of that. So in, in that in, in that sense, you know, are these, um, are people that are disadvantaged in terms of the climate change also struggling more with food insecurity because of the climate as it is? Yeah, so food insecurity is, oh my goodness. I mean, all of these things are so multifaceted, right? But yes, so, you know, part of what's happening is when climate impacts our food system, the cost of food goes up. Mm -hmm. Who is that going to affect the most? The people who have the least resources. So people who are already food insecure are going to find now that their money goes even less far and they are even more food insecure because of the supply chain impact because of climate change. Mm -hmm. And that's just one thing that could impact it. You know, there are a number of people of color who work in the agriculture industry. If suddenly crops can't be brought in, then people don't have, you know, the livelihood that they, you know, are working so hard to maintain. There's a lot of factors that can make people food insecure with climate change, but also in, it can affect people economically in other ways. Mm -hmm. Right. It just seems like such a huge, huge issue to me. And, um, and we're gonna, in one of my slides, when we talk about solutions, I'm going to talk a little bit about people, how people are actually using foods, um, food sovereignty as a lever to address 
environmental issues so yeah yes! <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to it all um, right so if if there's a, not any more comments or um, a muting maybe we'll move on all right i will move on because i promised y'all and y'all i'm hot it's hot in this house so you'll have to forgive me <laughs> I'm just gonna have to fan myself like a queen for a minute. Um, <laughs> I do love the fan. I, I just thought when you pulled it out first, I was like, that's so awesome. <laughs> for today where it's like hundred degrees out. Exactly. It's 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 a really apropos day to talk about climate change mm -hmm. um, in the middle of a heat wave. Um, but we just talked about impacts a lot. Let's get into solutions, okay? I promise you. So there are many ways to take climate action, but the ultimate goal is always the same. We want to reach a state of drawdown. Taking that word, friends, this is the most important word when it comes to climate change solutions, drawdown. And according to Project Drawdown, which is a leading source in climate change solutions, drawdown is the future point in time when levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere stop climbing and start to steadily decline. This is the point when we begin the process of stopping further climate change and averting potential catastrophic warming. It is a critical turning point for life on Earth. So how do we get to draw down? There are three main ways that we get to draw down, and here they are. First, we want to support and protect nature. We are the most privileged of living beings to be on this planet that already has built in natural, biological, and chemical processes um, within plants and soils and oceans that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it. Um, this is called carbon sequestration. And so when we protect and restore natural systems and spaces, we allow the planet to more effectively do what it's already designed to do, which is to pull that excess carbon down. If we can pull that excess carbon down, we can get the warming to stop and eventually decline. But we need to also do these other two measures. It's not enough for us to simply in, um, increase the amount of carbon sequestration. If we continue to dump carbon and other um, climate gases into the at greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, then no amount of carbon sequestration is going to turn the tide. So we also have to look at ways to eliminate, or if elimination is not possible, severely reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we are creating. And then, of course, the last thing that we need to do is the easiest. We just need to create a just and equitable society, <laughs> which, of course, is not easy at all. But because of all the things that we've covered, we know that human inequity is tied to environmental damage. So in order to keep break that cycle in that system, we have to work towards justice and equity. And so when I'm doing my work with Mass Audubon and we're tackling a new project or a new program, um, I often encourage the leaders and the team to think about what are the equity questions, right? And I put these out here because all of y'all clearly care about climate change and finding a solution to this problem. So as you go forward as your own like climate change solution leaders, I'd like you to also keep in mind, what are the equity questions? How do we design solutions that are keeping equity and justice in mind? There are lots of equity questions that could be asked, but these four I think are really important. And I also just want to um, give a shout out to the blogger Vu, who writes, um, who writes the blog um, Nonprofit AF, who first for was the first place that I saw these kind of equity questions. And Vu has a list of about nine that he uses in his work. And also that blog is amazing, so you should check it out. Um, but here are the four equity questions that I kind of distilled. One, who are the most impacted by the situation? right? When we think about a climate change situation, think about your own community even. Who do you think might be the most impacted? Maybe it's young children. Maybe it's people who are living in a local senior residency. Maybe there are people who are living close to um, the banks of a river that's flooding. Like who are the most impacted? Next, think about what is the historic historical context and what systems of power and privilege have been at play. 
Remember, none of this is accidental. It's all been systemically designed. In order to get rid of it, we are not breaking the system. We have to replace it. Um, people often say, I will often hear people say a comment of like, well, the system's broken. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. The system was designed to do exactly what it's doing. So what we need to do is dismantle it and build a whole new system. And in order to do that, we have to understand um, historical context. Then I encourage people to think about how can the voices and the needs of the most marginalized be centered and given priority? I borrow this phrase from other um, equity educators, which is that we need to learn how to design at the margins. Frequently, the people making decisions about solutions are the people least impacted and the people with the most power. And then they design something and then they hand it out to the people at the margins and say, look what we did for you. And then they wonder why things don't work. They're like, well, people didn't want to, we planted all these trees and nobody watered them. Well, did you ask people? Like if those are the type of trees they need, do they have the means to water these trees? Did you engage people in what they needed? No. And then these failures become excuses to kind of like say, well, we tried with diversity, it didn't work. Center the people at the margins. The last question I would like people to ruminate on is how do you, what are your identities? Like what is your upbringing, your culture, your education, your privilege, your biases, and how is that going to affect your perspective on a problem or a solution? So for example, one of the things that I am hyper aware of is that I am an ambulatory person. I can walk pretty much wherever I wanna go. So when I'm thinking about designing a climate solution, I am blind to the needs of people who are non-ambulatory. And it would be very easy for me to completely marginalize or even forget their needs. And so because I'm hyper aware of my own privileges, I make sure that I bring in and center the voices of people who have a different life experience and I give them the floor. Because if I take the lead in that particular space, it's not gonna go well. I don't have the lived experience to do that right. So those are really important questions. In the next few slides, I would like to share with you two movements that have been happening here in the United States that are um, led by people of color and youth that have done a really good job of centering equity in order to address climate and environmental issues. So, one of the first, the first one I want to talk about is the Black Farmers Movement. Um, and so to set some historic context around this, you know, land has always been a source of wealth and prosperity in the United States. And as early as the 1600s, laws were enacted that forbade Black people from owning land. Um, but during Reconstruction, the period following the American Civil War, you know, there was a short period of time where because the military was there to kind of keep law and justice, Black um, citizens were really allowed to prosper and thrive. They became like, got into law, education, so forth and so on. During that time, um, an educated Black middle class arose and 80% of them owned farms. But during the era of Jim Crow, Black people were robbed of their hard earned wealth. And according to some, millions of acres of Black owned land has been taken in just the past century. And the land that Black farmers lost between 1910 and 1970 is worth a conservative estimate of $300 billion today. So now what you have is a, is a movement led by Black farmers, but also many farmers of color have joined in bringing their um, historic and indigenous knowledge to the table. And they are using sustainable farming methods that have often been derived from traditional practices and transforming highly impacted spaces into arable farmland. So Mina, this is like right up your alley <laughs> because what people are doing is saying, hey, we live in communities that are food deserts where there's food apartheid. We cannot, we do not have access to the foods that are traditional to our cultures or maybe not access to fresh foods in general. But instead of waiting for people to change the situation, let's change the land around us. And so people have been rehabilitating um, you know, pieces of land in urban spaces and other places that have been just, were gray spaces and turning into prosperous green spaces that grows soil and grows foods. And this is really important because by creating acres of topsoil in this way, 
it cools the ambient temperatures, it reduces flooding, it traps greenhouse gases, which is all helping um, with the climate. And at the same time, it's enabling food sovereignty and empowering people who have been marginalized to take charge of their own sources of food and life, bringing equity, justice, and climate together. So, you know, how is it that they are doing, you know, how is this coming together? Like I said, it's supporting and protecting um, nature. So remember we talked about those three like ways to get the drawdown. So how is the Black Farmers moving, get it, Movement getting us there? It's supporting and protecting nature by building more topsoil and transforming gray space into green space. It's reducing greenhouse emissions by using sustainable farming methods instead of fossil fuel um, dependent farming methods. And it's creating an equitable society by increasing BIPOC access to healthy land and food. And if people are not familiar with the term BIPOC, that stands for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. Now I want to talk about the Sunrise Movement, which many of you have probably heard of because you're here wanting to talk about climate justice. So you probably have heard of this particular movement because this is like a front and center climate movement in the United States. Um, it is a youth-led climate movement to stop climate change and create millions of good paying jobs in the process. And they take political action by demonstrating, but also educating, and they are savvy communicators, letting people know exactly what is happening um, in the climate movement and how we can get to drawdown. Um, if people are familiar with the Green New Deal, the Sunrise Movement is, they are one of the architects of the Green New Deal. And one of the things that I really love about the Sunrise Movement um, in addition to all those things I just named, is that they are very outspoken about standing in solidarity with BIPOC liberation movements as well. So they recognize the importance of looking at racial equity in particular as part of the solution to the climate problem. So how is the Sunrise Movement helping to get to Drawdown? Well, they are using their voices and their networks to influence political outcomes. They know that there are certain politicians that are going to support climate movements and others who are not. So they are very savvy about making sure that the public knows who is on the side of climate change, um, climate change action, right? They also support the election of politicians who are working to protect land um, reduce carbon emissions and advance green energy solutions. So they actually handpick certain politicians and they work with those politicians to campaign for them and get them elected. And they've been successful in a number of cases. And then lastly, the thing that I think is super cool about them is that they are also focused on creating a green economy to replace the extractive and exploitative economy. That is the social justice piece of their movement. So, okay, and I promise I'm almost done and then we'll do like Q&A. <laughs> um, so the last thing I wanna talk about is taking action. So I just outlined these really beautiful like movements that are happening. And some of you might be ready to run out and join one of these movements, but a lot of you are probably thinking, all of that is really great, Nia, but it's also super overwhelming and I have no idea what I'm supposed to do next. Well, I'm gonna give you some ideas. So I like to break down climate action into like three different levels. You know, it's like steps, you work your way up. And in level one, it starts with things that are super accessible. Things like educating yourself and others, talking with friends, family, and neighbors, you know, and spreading awareness through social media and other networks about the climate crisis, and most importantly, climate solutions. And for those of you who are thinking, okay, like talking to my friends isn't really much action. That is not true. Research has shown that although the majority of people in the United States believe climate change is real, that almost no one actually has conversations about climate change. And so how are we supposed to solve a problem if none of us are talking about it? So even opening conversations with family and friends and coworkers is climate action. It's important. I also want to pull out this idea of expanding your network. Like, I think it's so important that we start thinking outside of boxes, get rid of boxes. Boxes are not good unless you're a cat and you're wanting to get in a box. But even with cats, you know, they only want the box they choose, right? So like, let's get outside of our box. Um, when you're thinking about what constitutes um, environmental problem, think about things that might not be traditional environmental problems like food security, like public health, access to green space, 
transportation justice and clean energy. These are items that you will often see in social justice spaces and environmental justice spaces, but you see much less in traditional environmental action spaces. Expand your networks and start bringing these together. It's all one problem and we have to start facing it like that. So let's say that you're ready for level two. Level two looks a little bit more communal. This is where you could go forth and join an advocacy group like Sunrise um, or provide financial support for an organization that is doing really great work. Um, like CREW, if you are familiar with that, it stands for Citizens Responding to Extreme Weather. They are a wonderful organization. Um, you could lobby your elected officials. It is literally their job to work for you. So don't be afraid to tell them what you want. And then lastly, you know, find opportunities to get involved locally. One of the things that I like to highlight for people as far as local action is learn about your local municipal vulnerability preparedness plan. Um, the MVP program is a really amazing like landmark program in Massachusetts. I think we might be the first and maybe the only state that has this kind of a program where communities can get grants from the state government um, to one, do an analysis of climate resiliency of their community. And then two, they could get money to actually create a climate resiliency plan and implement it. Right now, almost every single community in the Commonwealth has at least one MVP grant, either an assessment grant or a planning implementation grant. You can find out what your community's MVP strategy looks like by going to mass.gov. And the best part is it, if you live there, you have a right to not only know what's in the plan, but to actually directly influence how it's implemented. Any person living in the town has the right and is often encouraged to get involved, just most people don't know that it exists. So I say go forth and, and find out. And then the last thing that I'll talk about is level three. This is when you have had enough and you're ready to really invest in your climate action. And so these things can be a little bit more outspoken. Sometimes people are a little afraid, but these measures are the ones that get the most attention um, and have a lot of worth from that standpoint. This is things like organizing a rally, participating in a mass strike, joining a collective boycott, or something that is really important, but less showy publicly, divesting from polluting companies. I mean, divesting from fossil fuels is so critical because what I'm talking about is that these companies, fossil fuel companies, they get their capital by selling stock, right? They are public companies. And when, for example, like in my own retirement plan, you know, my retirement plan grows because people take the money that I put in there and they invest it. Well, I don't want my money investing in fossil fuels. So I've actually contacted the people in charge of my retirement plan and I have asked them to divest all of my monies from fossil fuel companies. My money will not go to help fossil fuel companies grow. There are schools and universities in the Commonwealth who have divested all of their investments, um, their endowments and so forth from fossil fuels. Mass Audubon actually has divested over 97% of all of our funds from fossil fuels. And the only reason why we haven't gotten the last three is because they are tied up in a plan that has to um, time out over time. But when it gets to the end of that period and we can divest, then those will come out as well. We refuse to let our money build into the problem. And you can do that too. You can advocate and for your companies to divest, your schools to divest, and you can divest your own personal funds. So the last thing I'll say, I know we're eight o'clock, but if people wanna stick around, I am here to, for questions and Q&A and comments. The last thing I wanna say is that getting to drawdown will take time and determination. And therefore we all need something to help us remain hopeful and to keep us engaged in the fight. You know, regardless of why you're doing it, you know, maybe you're doing it for the animals that, of the habitat that's being threatened, or maybe you're doing it because you're like, I know this coastal place where I grew up and I loved it and I can't imagine it gone. Or maybe you're thinking about your children or your grandchildren. Whatever it is, keep that hope close to you because hope is what's going to get you past the depression and get you into action. And action is how we stay resilient. And so that means hope is a form of climate resiliency. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you.
Thank you. I know you can't see the chat, but Deanna wrote, um, I love how you use one word, drawdown, to explain what you have to do to reverse climate change. Brilliant. And I'm going to use this with my climate action work with Mothers Out Front. Thank you. Helen says, I love your climate action levels. And Joyce says, it's wonder your, your talk is wonderful. Um, so again, feel free to write any questions. We'll take another few minutes, I think, to, for any questions or comments or thoughts that you might have. Feel free to unmute if you'd like to talk to Nia directly. Um, I do have, since, you know, I have lots of questions. Um, okay, let it out. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm, this has been bubbling for a while. Um, you know, I think you, from what I, it seems like you're talking about like sort of like U.S. based things. And I think sometimes I get really like frustrated because I'm thinking, well, the U.S. has kind of done some stuff, but now other countries are increasing their fossil fuel. So it feels like, it feels difficult. So like, um, what what would you suggest in terms of like our, our thinking around that? Thinking around other, like other countries that are, build like becoming more fossil fuel dependent or well just like it, you said that hope is you know you need it for resilience and like it feels hopeless sometimes mm. well you know the one thing i'll say about around the united states and and you know our influence globally is that we are global influencers um you know where we go other people go <laughs> so mm -hmm. oftentimes we also are um by a large degree the biggest polluters and so the hope that I see in that is that we live in the country with some of the greatest influence to make change and some of the greatest potential to reduce emissions. That's pretty awesome. We don't live in some, you know, smaller country that's looking at us and going, why won't you people get it together? Like we actually live in this country and we can advocate directly with the people who are holding the power. And so that could seem daunting, but it also is a place of hope. We are empowered, like mm -hmm. we can make change. And if we can make change here in the United States, that will have substantial global impacts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I see Terry has a question or his hand up. So go ahead, Terry. Nia, yeah, you mentioned that, uh, that you couldn't change some systems, you needed to replace those systems. And it, I, I'm not well studied in critical race theory or any of that, but I, I do have uh, just kind of a student of history and understanding the constitution and how it's, uh, we keep going back to the founding fathers, those uh, landed white men with slaves and to justify so many of our actions Mm -hmm. How do we, and yet when I have this conversation with my wife last night, how do I bring up the idea that we need to replace the system without being seen as a, uh, how do we have that conversation in the United <laughs> States without being seen as an anti-patriot? Mm, oh. and, and think of your, I, I have a very conservative brother who lives in North Carolina. I, I hear you, Terry. <laughs> Your question, I'll, I'll be completely honest. I don't think I have the ultimate answer to that one. Um, because I often feel myself that, that um, I often feel myself that people view me as anti-patriotic because I don't sugarcoat things. I'm not going to, I'm not going to whitewash or greenwash um, American history or Americans' present reality um, and in fact, when people say, well, if you don't like it, leave or other things like that, people have made these comments to me, even people in my family have made those comments to me. So I feel you on that. You know, I often will say to them, like, it's interesting that you are opposed to the idea of pushback. This country was founded by people who believed they were being oppressed and fought to make change. And now you're telling someone who believes that there is oppression and is fighting to make change that they should be quiet. Mm -hmm. That is the least patriotic thing I can imagine. This country was founded by people who fought for change. That's the most patriotic thing you could do. Wow. That, that's an excellent point in how to frame the conversation. Thank you for that. 
Yeah. But I guess this is maybe less environmental, but I think of the the failure even within our, our more left-leaning party um, when it comes to something like defund the police. Uh, it, there was no alternative suggested. That's part of the problem too, is that like too often, um, Oh, I talk to my friends about this kind of thing too. I'm like, one of the things that makes me crazy as a liberal is that we're always anti something, but what the heck are we in, in favor of? Like, <laughs> We're always ready to like destroy something. We never have a good example of what to put in this place. But the truth of the matter is, if you take a look at the movements that are being run by the people who are the most marginalized, they have solutions. They do have ideas for what should be in its place instead. The problem is the majority of people aren't putting them in the center. I mean, I will say, for example, the movement for Black Lives, which I know people have different thoughts around it, but if you actually read the material they have, they don't just stop at defund the police. They have a very sophisticated and detailed description of ways that we could improve safety in communities that is not the same thing as oppressive police action. And so it's not that they're saying just throw the baby out the bathwater. They have a plan. Nobody wants to listen to it and nobody elevates those conversations to the center. And that is part of the problem. This is the reason why diversity is so important. It's not just a nice to have, it's a must have. Throughout nature and in human communities, it has been shown over and over again that diversity of thought and experience actually produces better solutions to problems. As long as we keep our conversations homogenous, we will fail to find solutions because they exist in diverse spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so Helen has, I think, uh, probably our last question, which is how can we support the Black Farmers Movement? Yes. So there are a number of organizations, both locally and um, what's the word I'm looking for, and, and nationally that are involved um, in some part. They might not say specifically that they are part of the Black Farmers Movement, but it is part of the Black Farmers Movement. Um, so actually, give me a second here. One of the picture that I showed in my um, PowerPoint presentation is the founder of, so her name is Leah Penniman. I'll put that in the chat here. She wrote the book, Farming While Black. She mm -hmm. started Soul Fire Farm, which is an amazing farm situation. Um, and it's lovely. And she also has um, created here in the Northeast an organization that's called, I think it's called the Black Farmers Collective, um, but they do like trainings and all kinds of things to help people, all people, but they really emphasize um, communities of color to be able to acquire land, farm the land, um, and you know lift each other up. So um, Leah Penniman, Google her, she's amazing, um, and her organization, and supporting that organization is fabulous. There's also a number of local um, food sovereignty organizations that are really great. Mm -hmm. Well, so we definitely time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be looking them up. People are saying thank you so much. It's really interesting, inspiring, fabulous. Um, this has been it's been eye opening and fascinating and horrifying all at once. <laughs> um, so thank you, Nia, and thank you everybody who's been here tonight with your questions and your thoughts and. Um, I will definitely send out a link with um, the recording if you want to follow up and share it, because I think that this is a conversation that so many of us need to have. Absolutely. I really, if you do nothing else, talk to people about climate justice. That's an excellent way to end out this night. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you and so much for having have me. a wonderful night, everybody. Go out and like do something. Do something. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs>